As For Argyle begins its contribution to Homecoming Argyle, there's no better place to start than with the current and 13th Duke of Argyle, whose family history and this place are bound together. Your Grace, you have had your own homecoming with your family now settled here at Inverary Castle. How did that feel? Well, I mean, it, you know, we're, we're almost, we've almost got our homecoming. Our homecoming is actually going to be next year when the renovations are finished in the castle. But, you know, it's very exciting for us to be, as a family, to be all here together um, and to be back in the castle is going to be tremendous. It's, you know, the first time we will have done it uh, since my father died. So for me, it's very exciting. Is it interesting to be putting your own stamp on the place with the renovations? I think, you know, everybody has a sort of, you know, what you call a sort of generation step change. Uh, you know, the castle, they started building the castle in 1745. And the one thing that they forgot to put in was any central heating. <laughs> um, so, you know, all of my life, you know, I've lived there with fires and everything else and electric heaters. Uh, so to be able to put central heating into it, which, you know, works in two different ways. It's actually conservation heating. So it's, we're actually putting it in to preserve the fabric of the castle for future generations, but also at the same time to put a little bit of warmth into our lives as well. Which is a good idea. It's a very good idea. <laughs> you carry the name Argyle. How does that shape your relationship with the place? Well, I think, I mean, it's quite a difficult question to, to, to answer because, you know, I am now 40. Uh, I've been living here in Argyle for on and off for 35 years uh, and it's always been a part of me it's not something that just came to me one day so I feel very much a, a part of Argyle part of the local community and part of the area and it's something that's just built up over the years of learning to appreciate it understand it explore it uh, and see the way it works so it's not a, it's not as of a sudden sort of shock to it it's just been a progression I was thinking about that and I was thinking that until your father died the 12th Duke you were the Marquis of Lawn, and yet the name Argyle must have been in your consciousness from an early age. How did your father introduce and guide you to what that means? Well, there was never there was never any sort of sit down and this is going to be it. This is this is your destiny. This is what you're going to do. It was very much a sort of process of osmosis, where you know you learn it, drip feed it, bit by bit, bit by bit, and you know you knew I knew that maybe. There was no guarantee that maybe one day uh, I would be able to stand in his footsteps and, and uh, lead the family uh, and you know, carry on from where I am today. You mentioned the family and it occurs to me that your unique role in Argyle gives you parallel responsibilities to your family in the protection of the inheritance and to the wider Argyle, I guess in social responsibility. Are there occasional conflicts between these and how do you strike a balance? Well, I mean, I've always said that, you know, being, being inheriting it when you're young has a, a, a lot of benefits because you're able to do a lot more all at the same time. And, you know, so far in my life, it's just been a process of juggling as many different balls as I possibly can at the same time. But, you know, I started off um, in 2001 doing many different things uh, and I've kind of sort of distill that down a little bit. So, you know, for example, I don't work uh, full-time for Shivers Brothers any longer. I'm just a consultant. So that's freed up a lot of time and I'm able to spend more time up here. And I suppose that, I mean, there are conflicts of interest, uh, but it's more a question of priorities, I think. You've got to prioritise what you want to do and when you want to do it. Do you see the events that you run, the Connect Festival, and this year, coming up, the Spirit of the West, as events that actually marry those parallel responsibilities, they must be good for the estate and they certainly are good for Argyle. Well, I think in the past, you know, people who've had the benefit of owning large estates and big houses have also run a business at the same time. But today, in today's environment, it is, you know, a large company with a huge amount of responsibility. And the way that I see it is that, you know, everything has to wash its face, it's got to make money, Otherwise, there's no point having it. Uh, so I've taken the, the view that you know, Inverara has to work. It's a great attraction. You know, we're very lucky to draw people from across the world who want to come to Argyle for you know, many, many reasons, be it the, the history, be it their inheritance, be it the beautiful countryside. So they want to come here, and the idea now is to try and 
give them more reasons to come at different times of the year and to keep them for a little bit longer. So I think you know, the music festival is certainly a very positive thing to have. Uh, and to be able to bring that many people to the west coast of Scotland is fantastic. Uh, the Spirit of the West, which is part of the year of homecoming, is again you know, a wonderful thing. It showcases what we do really well. And that's our food, that's our you know, the beautiful uh, countryside, the historic houses, and everything that we've got in our garden. So I'm you know, very, very positive about it. And I hope you know, we're able to make it a success this year uh, in the hope that we'll be able to continue for the years to come. You mentioned the landscape, and of course our guide is more than landscape, but I wonder, do you have a favourite place or a special place in Argyll, and what does it mean to you? Well, I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a very passionate fisherman, and I love the, the peace and quiet and the tranquility of, you know, being able to spend an hour on a riverbank on my own, watching what's going on, listening to what's going on. So I think, you know, any of the rivers that we have on the estate, have a, you know, they have a lot of sentimental uh, feeling to me, because it's the one opportunity that I get just to, you know, clear my mind of everything that's going on and you know, think of new ideas and do new things. So I, and that, that to me is, is, is very special. It sounds like the perfect counterpoint to what must often be a very public life. Well, public is, you know, I guess it's what you make of it. You, know, you, put it, you, you get out of it what you put into it. Uh, and I'm now spending a lot more time uh, with Campbells from around the world, uh, with visitors, talking to them. But I've in the past, I've never really had that sort of time to do it. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, I've got a young family who demand a lot of my time. So it's a question of balance, really. You said that you enjoy fishing because, among other things, it gives you time to think up new ideas. You've just launched a second treasure hunt in Tobermory Bay, looking for the wreck of an Armada galleon that's known to have sunk there. How did you get the salvage rights to the vessel? Well, just to be totally clear, it's not the second uh, expedition. I think every generation of my family uh, since the mid-1600s have tried to find it. <laughs> um, but I think it's, you know, it's, there's a sort of a little bit of Indiana Jones or whatever in all of us. Uh, and it is a mystery. Uh, and, you know, I'm doing my bit trying to find it. Um, but so far we haven't been successful, we're still trying. Um, and we just have to hope that you know, one day we are able to find something. And so do your family have the rights to do this? We do have the rights to do it. We have the salvage rights for it uh, and have had it since the mid-1600s. How did you get them? Well, I'm not entirely sure the reasons why we did get them, but I mean, they're all written down in various different charts, but they're quite difficult to read. <laughs> But everybody believes they say what you say they say. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, the history shows that there might be something there. Um, whether it's what we think that's there, I, I don't know. Time will tell. I gather it might be a treasure ship or it might have been a troop carrier, which would be rather disappointing. Well, I don't, you can say disappointing, but I think the historical value of it, whatever's there, uh, would be very important, uh, irrespective of what we actually find. I think the historical value would be very important. And the obvious question is, if your team find it, and if it is the treasure ship, what would you do with the money? Well, I think it's a bit of a chicken and egg story, because we don't know what's there. I have my own views of what I'd like to do, uh, should we be lucky enough to find anything. Uh, and when we find something, I will be able to share my views with everybody else. <laughs> and until then. <laughs> until then. Well, I mean, you know, you can speculate and you can talk about things and, you know, people just pick up on it. So. And you don't want to make promises either. Well, I don't want to make promises, exactly. So we'll, we'll wait and see. If we find anything, uh, then we'll be in a better position to tell people what we want to do with it. Well, I'm sure all of our guys hope you succeed. Well, I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Your Grace. My pleasure.